Hey everyone. Uh, uh, first of all, I thank you for coming. I'm, I'm can't be more happy to be with those people here on stage. Really, we're going to touch uh, a very interesting uh, subject, in my opinion, which is token incentives, token economics, etc. Um, and uh, before we will start talking about that, the challenges, the problems, um, the legal issues, like all of those. Uh, interesting things about token economics and token incentives. We'll do like very, very short introduction. Uh, myself, Amos, I'm from Node Capital, um, founder and uh, partner. I'm Travis. Um, started a crypto-focused investment firm based in New York called North Island Ventures. We've made seven investments in Israel in the last year, which has been great. Um, it's awesome to be here. Great turnout. I was thinking I haven't spoken to this many Jews since my bar mitzvah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Yeah, Aronson, I am a co-founder and CEO at Horizon Labs, which is a blockchain technology company. We also do a token advisory services, including um, the launch of the ApeCoin and other work with uh, the ApeCoin DAO, which we'll be talking about in the roundtables. Um, Eden mentioned before when I introduced myself that I also have a, a previous lifetime. Um, I ran the Zelle Entrepreneurship Program here for 10 years. I'm still very involved because I just can't really leave. Uh, Eden Shochat, so I uh, bought my first Bitcoin 2012, made the first blockchain investment in Kolo uh, 20. 14, which was insane, and ICO, and then reverse ICO, which was surprisingly harder than an ICO. Uh, so we've gone through a bunch of shit, and um, super curious about incentive systems and how to dethrone the incumbents. And so that yeah, that that will be the topic of uh, my roundtable. Let's start with you know, Bitcoin was the first cryptocurrency, the first blockchain. Um, it started from proof of work. Uh, which, you know, this was the incentive uh, system of the platform. And today we moved into a lot of different incentives um, across different blockchains. Um, I, wanna, I want us to talk about, you know, where we started and where we are today. I think uh, incentives are at the core of everything in the crypto blockchain space. The, really what made Bitcoin so special was that it created this incentive for people to build this unbelievably secure network. And following along that, you know, you had other blockchains like Ethereum, but then people started um, really experimenting with totally novel ways of incentivizing users with tokens on top of Ethereum. Um, where we are today is... Um, there's an extraordinary amount of um, new ideas around how you can use tokens to bring on new users. There hasn't been really a tremendous amount of success, I would say, other than layer ones in terms of um, capturing users for longer periods of time. Um, so, um, you know, there's a lot of work to be done. That's, that's really where I think we, we stand today. What do you think is is a good incentive uh, mechanism in in the type of blockchain and protocols that we see today, right? Like we have, of course, we have proof of work, we have proof of stake, which everyone knows is kind of like um, uh, the new, let's say, trend in the past uh, years. Uh, but we see also other type of incentive mechanisms on protocols, etc. Uh, what do you think is kind of like a good incentive model and what is a bad incentive model. So we need to separate between kind of mining and validation type incentives and then app layer incentives. So in, in the infrastructure side, kind of there, there are a bunch, some of them from Israel, right? So beyond proof of stake, the time and space, and anything that you can show that you devote resources, be it by ownership or be it with compute. I, I find those super interesting and, and, and vulnerable potentially, but Quite frankly, it will just take a while for that to shape out. The app layer is is actually where I, I find the, the more interesting models. And there, the bad models are the ones that use multiple tokens uh, that are impacted or correlated between each other 
in order to create value where there is none. Obviously, we've, we've seen the crash um, of, of such models. Uh, I think the good models actually create value that is aligned, value to the token holder that is aligned with the network value, that is truly aligned with the network value. And there are a bunch of ideas here, anywhere like reputation. There are the old models, right, where you take money for getting someone to work at a certain company, right? The LinkedIn typical model or the headhunting model, which roughly is about reputation. And when you copy over those incentives, so basically just pay out with token uh, that hiring fee or placement fee, I think that's a bad model because it doesn't generate value in the network versus saying, well, what's really the impact of reputation? How do I monetize a reputation in order to increase the network value? The more people are involved there and there's more opinions about people that are involved. These are great token models because they correlate strongly. Do, do you have a favor or example of a good app layer incentive model? So I mentioned the reputation. It's, uh, I'm not sure whether Asaf is here. Yeah, he's right back. Okay. So that's, um, that, that's a really interesting way to rethink the way LinkedIn, right? Think how terrible the LinkedIn, when someone vouches for you, it's basically noise, right? Never mind that connections are noise. And never mind, like everything about LinkedIn is fake. And, <laughs> Uh, and, and by being able to tie it to tokens and saying that, hey, if I, if, if I truthfully say that a certain person has significant talent and that can be validated over time and through that there's accrual of value in the network, that's a great model. And I think just to, to follow on that, when you talk about good token and bad token, I think one of the key things to think about is do you really need a token hmm. at all? And, or are you just doing it because there's a hype value to having a token? And to the ones that are hype value to having a token tend to be not so useful and not great tokens. And they ultimately also fail to create that network effect. So a, a good token is something that is able to, and especially if you look on, on kind of DAOs, DAOs are, humans always have ways to vote on things and to, and to think about things and participation um, even though participation was very high in our elections uh, yesterday, um, generally participation tends not to be as high as you want. But if you look at DAOs, it's taking um, a kind of an old school human need, and to the extent that it really creates value to the community as, as a DAO, then it makes sense. Otherwise, if it's just a way to vote for people, I think, and you see many DAOs that have this, then you just have very, very low participation rates and it, you effectively don't do anything. What do you think like specifically on, on let's say, uh, ApeCoin, right, as an example? Everyone knows uh, the ecosystem. What do you think are like, you know, the advantages of the model of the ApeCoin and the disadvantages, where it's like a weak model, where it's a strong model? Oh, that's a, that's a big one. Because I think, first of all, it's very much um, in formation. They're trying out a lot of things. We're, we're obviously, um, you know, partners, but not um, tech partners, and we're not, we certainly don't make decisions, and we do, like everyone else, raise proposals. I think there are, um, it's, it's really an experiment in all kinds of things. So I think the DAO itself is, oh, oh gosh. Okay. Um, so the, the DAO itself is an experiment in a, in a smaller group of people. It's, you know, um, all in, tens of thousands of people, but it's still a smaller group. And I think it's going to be really interesting. Right now, it's very engaged, and there are a lot of activity and a lot of um, um, participation. But I think it's going to be a, an experiment over time to how relevant and how much um, engagement there's going to be. I think ape staking, what we're going to be talking about in uh, the roundtable, is another experiment in trying to being able to create incentives for people to be aligned and engaged in the in the community, but that's one example. So like many early adopters, my interest in crypto started with Bitcoin, and I think a lot of Bitcoiners were very skeptical of proof of stake in the early days. They thought it might not be secure, it might not be centralized, but I think that this concept of stake and um, is, is both underappreciated and underexplored. I think the notion that you can own part of some system, you can 
lock it up and put it at stake and you can either earn rewards for doing the right thing or lose some of your assets for doing the wrong thing is a very powerful primitive. So if you're thinking about bringing some sort of tokenomics model into what you're doing, I think exploring some version of staking is the best place to start. The other advantage it has is it's very relatable and understandable. I've seen um, models that are uh, potentially brilliant but incredibly complex. And depending on who your users are, if you create something that's too complex, it doesn't matter how brilliant it is. Uh, you're not going to get adoption for it. So um, yeah, I, I, I think there's a just the design space for staking in general is massive. Pretty interesting to think about just elections yesterday, right? So if you had to stake in order to get a vote, right? And, and, and what does that mean about capitalism versus democracy, right? But because in or effect, like a, a country, if you run it as a DAO, right, it probably would have a better effect because right now it's the issue, it's, it's the death of the commons in the sense that I don't have a downside in voting to whoever, right? I just want to provide an opinion, right? And so... It's, it's funny because, you know, the discussion on DAOs is, is like a whole discussion by itself, but I feel like DAOs kind of like moving, um, um, they're going through the same phases that we went in the democracy, right? So it's like, okay, let's try voting, you know, everyone have the same voice. No, let's have... Um, electors and like it's, it's, it's basically the same history it's just repeating um, but regarding to uh, token incentives I think like to me when I'm trying to put it um, kind of like simply will be it's very hard for me to uh, to see that there will be value for let's say a centralized app which issues a token to just give rewards um, where the token is really disconnected from what's happening on the app, right? Because it's centralized. Also, if what happens if the app, you know, dies or, you know, the people stop working on it, will the token still have value? And those are kind of like the questions that I always ask myself when I'm looking at apps um, issuing a token. Um, um, and then on the other side, like the good models is where everything happens on chain and you can close the loop of the transactions and 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 basically have the value sits on chain on the blockchain or protocol itself. So that's kind of like the way that I like quickly doing the. But, uh, let me challenge that, right? So one trend, uh, I'm not sure how many here are involved, right? The move from free to play to free to own, right? So you actually instead of selling NFTs for you know hundred thousand dollars, you actually get them for free as part of playing the game and. The, the, the notion, the idea is that the, as more distribution happens because people have a vested interest to distribute, then the, there will be appreciation of the NFTs even if they were provided for free. Now, most games, and it's totally valid, will always be a centralized entity or a centralized venture. Um, I, I think the question is, are the NFTs distributed and are they interoperable with other ecosystems that would maintain value even if that game is shut down? So yeah. it doesn't need to be that, that the app is distributed, but there should be an ecosystem that is distributed. I, I think that actually like the current gaming state is broken with, with blockchain, both in terms of like the economy, the token economics, but, but also in terms of you know, what is open source and what is not open source. So for example, if you develop a game, I think it's very important for it to be open source if you're releasing NFTs or you're releasing a token. Because again, it's the question of what happens if people stop operating the, the game. So all of the value basically disappears. Unless, like you said, uh, you know, I can reuse those NFTs in, in another platform, etc. And there are many projects working on that interoperability, on, on, on those type of things. So, so yeah, I mean, um, we're really like starting to see all of the gaming in crypto, and I think a lot of the games are starting to understand that that uh, the game, the token, and the NFTs will have more value if they're interoperable and connected to other games and other ecosystem, etc. Yeah. Um, so, what do you think about the process of of working on to uh, tokenomics? Uh, like a lot of uh, I see a lot of uh, entrepreneurs kind of like saying, okay, 
I know how to build a product, but I'll, I'll outsource the token economics, right? Like, what do you think is the process of, of building a good token economics? I think that, um, I'm not going to use this. <laughs> I, I think that the notion that you're good at the product but not the tokenomics uh, often makes no sense because the tokenomics, for them to be valuable, have to be part and parcel of the product. Yeah. And, um, you know, generally speaking, um, you already took one shot at consultants earlier. Consultants are, are on average not that great. So I wouldn't bring them in and expect them to design some core component of your system. They just don't have. No offense. You guys are probably amazing. Well, I'm going I'm to answer that. <laughs> um, you know, they um, often don't have the incentive to care nearly as much as you do, right? And they're not as close to everything else. So, you know, you have to design them yourself. And if you feel like you're not capable of it, then you probably shouldn't be doing it in general. So I'll challenge that. Um, I, I agree with you that, like product, you need to be able to also understand the tokenomics. If you don't, then you've got a problem because the tokenomics are part of your product. However, I do think that there's a combination here of two things. One, it's a, it's a very nascent um, place, and there is a lot of benefit to um, really digging into comparables and seeing what's going on. So to the extent that it's very hard to be in the know of everything and what's going on and on top of all of that, then I think getting support from a team like Horizon Labs that wouldn't do the tokenomics for you, but would help think through your business, the product, and how tokenomics actually support it. So I think that's really the way that that, that, that could work, um, and that would be my challenge to you. But I really agree with you that if you can't get your tokenomics right, then you don't really have a, um, a right to exist in the first place. Yeah, I think it's often a red flag that a company would even want to hire, um, in some instances, um, outsource this completely, right? Like, I think... Actually, um, you know, Israel, during the ICO boom, there were groups that were just cranking this stuff out, and almost all of those were scams. Um, and there's, there's a reason, right? It wasn't central to, to what the company was really building. I would say one thing, which is about participation in the high-tech ecosystem, right? So 320, I think, thousand people generate 20% of GDP, 50% of exports, but it's not an inclusive kind of environment. And actually, this is an amazing opportunity where economists that historically would have a pretty hard time getting into high tech, maybe as kind of a CFO path or whatever, this is actually a great opportunity to insource some of the kind of more brilliant, especially in the, we have some great infrastructure in the academia in Israel, and, and bring them over and actually have them be part of the team um, it's so core to what you do in thinking over time that having someone that leads that, that thinks about economics on an ongoing basis is actually not that expensive. And it's not rocket science. It's, un it's understanding people, understanding what it is that they want to achieve. How can you incentivize them? That's what you generally do with economics. So it's, it's an opportunity to actually bring into the fold a new kind of a talent, which I think is super positive. And we have some in the audience here. I mean, I think it also relates a lot to product market fit, right? Like, what is product market fit with, with the token? It's, it, it iterates just like a product. Um, you, you can't, like, it's rarely that you will achieve everything and, like, have it on spot the, the same time you wrote the white paper, right? It's like, um, it, it takes time. You um, want to say something? Yeah. So you mentioned this concept of product market fit. It also begs the question of when would you launch a token? Um, if you're launching a layer one blockchain, you need the token from day one, obviously. Um, but I think that if you're launching a product that's going to use a token to turn it into some sort of decentralized network that isn't a layer one, you probably actually want to wait until you have product market fit. I think one of the best examples of this is the ENS token. So ENS has um, broad adoption. There's millions of people who have ENS names. And they launched the token after it hit a certain point. And that token actually, um, you know, it has fundamental value to it. Every time somebody buys a new ENS name or renews it, there are 
uh, revenue that go to the protocol that the token holders have a claim on. And that's great. Like, there's a real business around it. And there aren't that many examples of that. Um, but I think, you know, particularly at the seed stage, Series A stage, you know, you have some idea about a token. Well, um, in some instances, it makes sense to prove that people actually want the core product that you're building. Another thing that is interesting, I mean, for me also, I was an entrepreneur, now an investor. Um, incentives for founders. Um, that's, that's a very interesting subject uh, from both sides. Uh, what do you think about that? So we've been talking mostly about incentives for miners or validators and incentives for users and or investors. Um, it may be the case that, that the incentive model is most broken with the founders because um, first off, you know, we've built up these systems in, in the corporate world and in the startup world that are battle tested over decades to basically solve what you might call the principal agent problem um, and to keep everybody kind of going in, in the same direction. Um, with, uh, with tokens, A, you have very short vesting schedules. Founders get liquidity way too early into what are highly volatile markets. And sometimes they just make a ton of money and then they, you know, go on their way. Quiet quit, as they call it today. Um, but there's actually two other issues that um, uh, sort of, well, there's one core one that really um, isn't the founder's fault. So in the U.S., you have a tremendous amount of regulatory uncertainty around these tokens. And, you know, there's the risk that they could be deemed securities if, if, it, they're too centralized, and one of the key things you look for there is, is there an individual who's promoting the token, um, and is the value of the token dependent on their actions? So I think what you've seen with a bunch of the DeFi tokens, for example, is, you know, you have a founding team launch it, and then, um, you know, they kind of get to say or have to say, like, this isn't mine anymore. This belongs to the community. And so what you end up with is a situation where nobody's looking after sort of the business model around the token and where they cannot turn on simple, you know, revenue fee models because they think it will put them at legal risk. So, you know, my hope, I wouldn't say I'm short-term optimistic, but I am medium-term optimistic, is that we will have a, an environment where, you know, you don't have to make these, these trade-offs. I think that even just... I love the, basically we deleted the entire history of uh, building corporates, right? So even as simple as uh, not being able to issue additional tokens as you make additional investment and kind of have hard-coded split, which means that if you gave out too much or too little, and then things are not going that great, and there should have been something like a down round, where do you get the tokens to do the down round? Suddenly, it's do founders give it up? Do previous investors give up? It's just hard coded, and by not thinking about this and not leveraging kind of what corporate history has shown as what's the best mode, um, that's actually a problem, and it's uh, even more so. It's an unsolved problem. Yeah, it's, it's an unsolved as be, because the solutions many times would allow the smart contract to issue additional tokens, which the community will have issues with. So uh, there are obvious issues, right? But, but there are ways around it. Again, DAO is like board of directors, and there are ways around it. Um, the, e even a bigger issue is kind of the dual holdings of stock and tokens, right? And, and I've... I wrote an article some, I think, six years back. 2016. 2000, Jesus, we're old. Um, that your company will self-destruct, right, which is actually a good thing. It sounds like a bad thing, but you should actually kill the company and not have any equity value at that point. But people then have an issue around governance and how do you... So there is a lot of learning that is still required because the current status quo is actually messed up both for founders, investors, token holders. So there's a lot of learning of, of actually how to um, allocate those additional tokens over time and how you remove kind of the LTD or the Inc entity, which becomes irrelevant, right? Because all the value then moves over to a token. So effectively, the shares should be worth nothing at that point. 
right? Because you move the value away. But I, I think that conflict of interest that you're referring to and, and just the general idea in this space is that we're using, I'm scared, I'm scared of this. I'll just hold, hold it there. Um, <laughs> that when, when we try to take something that works in one paradigm and then shift it into another paradigm, there's obviously going to be some problems. And so tokens aren't stock in a company. There are very, very um, large visceral differences. And so I think there needs to be, there's still a lot of work to do to make that transition and figure out how the incentives would work in it. I think we're really far away from that. And, and the idea that the tokens are just an, a new form of equity is, is just wrong. Um, I, I totally agree. I'm just saying they can't coexist. Yeah, no. Right? So the coexistence actually, when, when you as a CEO need to make a decision, and the decision should be do we increase shareholder value or do we increase token holders value, these are in conflict many times. Right. So you just can't have both. Great. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.